I'd like to welcome you as you're joining us and we move through our program today, especially welcoming those who have just joined and are watching the live stream on our website. We had over a thousand people from 109 countries register for this panel. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lisa Pote, I'm a social worker, and I serve as the executive director of the Beck Institute for Cognitive Behavior Therapy, the host for this event. We are a 28-year-old nonprofit outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have the mission of improving lives through excellence and innovation in cognitive behavior therapy and recovery-oriented cognitive therapy. I'm on screen, but our team of over 60 employees and another 30 faculty stand right next to me as they carry out our work in the US and around the world making a difference in the lives of people with mental health concerns every day. Our panel discussion is being offered at no cost, thanks to our donors and sponsors and attendees, just like you. I mentioned that we're a nonprofit, which means that every dollar that comes into Beck Institute in turn gets used to fund our programs and the scholarships that help support a broad range of trainings that trainees have access to. You can help us continue this work, help fund a scholarship with a donation supporting our nonprofit mission today. If everyone gave even $10, it would make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, I invite you to do just that. You can contribute through our website at beckinstitute.org and click on the Donate Now button. Before we get started with the panel, will honor Estelle Richmond with the Beck Institute Excellence Award. I'd like to introduce our president, Dr. Judith Beck, who will present Estelle with her much deserved award. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our conference as well. And I am so proud to present the 2022 Beck Institute Excellence Award to Estelle. This award recognizes individuals and organizations and initiatives that improve lives through the advancement of evidence-based practices in the health and mental health fields. This year, the award goes to Estelle Richmond for her work creating and advancing programs that improve the lives of vulnerable children and families. Estelle has been a lifelong public servant. She's worked at the city, state, and federal levels, and her particular focus has been on health equity and systems change. She's also served on numerous foundation boards and nonprofit boards, and we are so lucky that she also serves on the board of directors of Beck Institute. Estelle has spent decades advocating for care coordination and providing relevant services that address really all aspects of social determinants of health. Her efforts have resulted in measurable outcomes, including the following a statewide increase in the percentage of foster children finding permanent homes, a drop in wait time for receipt of intellectual disability services, and improvements to child support collection services. Estelle was one of the co-founders and is the former CEO of Community Behavioral Health, CBH, which is a nonprofit organization contracted by the city of Philadelphia to provide behavioral health and substance use services to Medicaid recipients in Philadelphia County. Well over 100,000 Philadelphians have used services covered by CBH. Estelle also created the state of Pennsylvania's first Bureau of Autism, ensuring that children on the autism spectrum and their families receive much needed support throughout their childhood and into adulthood. Here at the Beck Institute, Estelle is known for her keen intelligence, her leadership and integrity. Her experience and expertise in policy, public health, family and child welfare, health equity, education and social services make her such an incredible asset to Beck Institute as we continue our work to make evidence-based mental health treatment accessible to all. Please join me in watching Estelle accept this well-deserved award. I feel very honored to receive this recognition from the Beck Institute. This is very special as I knew and had many conversations with Dr. Beck. 
he was an icon and a hero to me. Cognitive behavior therapy has been an integral part of my professional life for 50 years. I started as a student of RET, Rational and Motive Therapy with Albert Ellis, and moved to Cognitive Behavior Therapy with Aaron Beck. It has opened many doors for me and shaped me as an individual to become an effective professional and a leader. I truly um, am honored to receive this award. I want to take this opportunity to make comments in two areas. First, we have what we have learned from the perfect storm of now. And second, I'd like to share what I've learned from working in the human services field in the last 50 years. We are slowly recovering from two years of a perfect storm. We often refer to times when three things unexpectedly happen within the same time period and produce catastrophic results as a perfect storm. The three parts now are the COVID pandemic, the George Floyd spark of looking at racial inequality, and the unprecedented violence we are currently experiencing. The lemonade of the pandemic, which is slowly releasing its grip, is we must deal with health and inequities. We must understand the relationship between physical health care and behavioral health care, and we must assure that people of color have real access to care. Even more challenges await people who rely on Medicaid and Medicare for their health care. Too often, they are at or below the poverty line. They are most often children, mom and dads, and people with co-occurring chronic diseases, asthma, diabetes, mental illness, and addictions. They are working at minimum wage, wages and often without health insurance. And yes, they have many other life challenges, unstable housing, food insecurity, fluctuating eligibility, work insecurity. Yes, as you know, the social determinants of health. They are making decisions every day about time off from work, whether they lose pay or make a preventive health appointment, whether to spend money on co-pays or food, co-pays or rent, and whether to get routine care or urgent care. We have known for years that our healthcare system is fragile and that the poorest among us are the most vulnerable. We have known for years about health disparities and the impact on people of color. And we have known for years that urban areas are extremely vulnerable for contagious diseases. However, the pandemic, COVID-19, hit us in the face with the real with the reality. We can no longer move slowly to close the disparities gap. If we have learned anything from the trauma of 2020, it is racial disparities, health disparities, um, and moving slowly can no longer be tolerated. We have an opportunity to be intentional about our work to close the disparities gap, to improve health equity, and indeed to change our path to one of true health care for all. In many ways, those of you or those of us who work within the field of mental health are aware of and have struggled with this reality. We now need to come together, work together, to find ways to use the lessons learned from COVID to improve our healthcare system. The death of George Floyd and those who died before and after him in a justice system that struggles with fairness taught us that we still have a ways to go to address, address um, racial equity. However, the lemonade here was bringing conversations into the light, having conversations at all levels that have been difficult but meaningful about racial issues in our country. We are moving the needle, albeit quite slowly. The third part of the perfect storm is still happening. The violence and substance abuse in our states, cities, and neighborhoods, and yes, in our rural areas. Um, are impacted also. We are getting, we are again struggling to understand the anger of our young people and how to give them hope for the future. I believe the answer to this one 
will belong to those of us in the mental health field. However, we need to reach out and understand how and why six and eight year olds believe they won't live to be 20 or 30. We need to understand why the staggering increase in, in drug overdoses in real and uh, suburban areas is off the chart. We need to understand why our culture has not given hope to these people. While the media reports on the gun violence in our large cities and the drug overdoses in our suburban and rural areas, we will struggle to determine solutions. We need to understand the true impact of trauma, not only on children, but their parents, teachers, administrators, and elected leaders. We need to reach out more to bring the private and public systems together to offer hope and interventions. And we as mental health professionals must lead the way to this solution. My last comments. In the past 50 years of being in senior policy and leadership positions at the city and county, state and federal levels, I have experienced an awful lot as you can imagine. Much of the learning has been through experiences, both good and bad. Sometimes I think I've learned more from my bad experiences than the good ones. However, I, I want to share just a few of my observations. First, leadership is important. Leaders must understand the political environment and how government works. We must begin to make that work with and for us. Leaders must understand financing and have a financial strategy. While we can blame everything on, on the government not offering enough, enough funding or insurance companies not reimbursing enough, we must understand financial strategy and have one of our own. We must have, leaders must have a media strategy. That media strategy needs to clarify, not muddle the water. We must be clear and intentional about our statements. Next, I can never say enough about strong communication skills, but from my perspective, it's not about talking, it's about listening. We must be good leaders. And one of the things I think I have learned time and again, the term active listening actually means listening, not planning your next comments. I think I have learned over these years that we need to set concrete but realistic goals. And the goals need to, to stress performance outcomes. Um, we need to make decisions around whether something worked, about whether it gets us to the end point, not whether it was a good planning. We need to talk and listen to the people who use our services, consumers and families. We need to include them as often as possible in policy discussions. My basic belief is that if, if, if a policy is going to impact your life, then you need to be at the policy table to create it. We have a long way to go with this one, but I have seen true progress. We also need within that same framework, work with system advocates, whether they are, um, programmatic advocates or whether they're legal advocates. And again, the key is to listen and use them to shape good policy. Um, we need to develop relationships and partnerships in everything we do. I started, when I started writing this, I in thinking about partnerships. I can, you know, it occurred to me, you can never have too many partners. Well, you know, I, I guess I don't want to make an extreme statement but relationships and partnerships will really determine whether something works. We need to nourish innovation in ourselves and in others. Um, being innovative means trying something. Maybe no one gave you permission. Maybe no one said we need this, but you think there's a spot. You think there's a void. Nourish the innovation within yourself. Practice flexibility. It seems that as we both get older or more experienced or move to higher positions, we become rigid. Fight that. Practice flexibility. Listen keenly and begin to be as flexible as possible. 
talk and encourage risk. You know, whenever I, I, I talk to or mentor young people these days, probably one of the things at the top of my list is encourage them to take risks. Most successful operations were viewed as risky when they started. You know, anything that's a gold standard now didn't start as a gold standard. It started as it's a good idea and people continue to work with it and look at it and it became shaped to become um, um, a good program. So take risk, encourage risk and focus on making things successful. When starting a new project or starting any project, ask yourself, what does success look like? Don't proceed until you can art articulate the answer. I've seen over the years way too many people in circumstances where people say, well, this is a good idea. I think I'm going to try it. But they have no clue what success looks like at the other end, and they can't define it. Stop, think, and be able to answer the question, what does success look like? Let research drive policy and practice. You know, there's an awful lot of good research out there written across the world. And too often, we reinvent the world rather than reading where the research is and letting that drive our policy and practice. Um, I, you know, too many times I hear those working in the field not showing much respect for, um, for, for research and policy. Consequently, it takes good research and policy 10 years sometimes to reach the place where it can actually influence what we do. That's way too long. And we need to find ways to make sure that we can drive that policy into practice much sooner. One of my favorite things I think I've learned over the years, and it takes focus and practice, is do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Way too often, we try to get to perfect. We try to make it really the right way. And in the process, we miss the change that can make things better. So while we always want to strive to get to make things the best we can, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And um, one of my final statements is when given opportunities um, to volunteer, do it. And there's so many opportunities for, for volunteer work whether it's on a board, whether it's at a school, whether it's just being part of a task force. But when you have opportunities to volunteer, take them. There's so much to learn and there's so much to give back. I want to close with a story about my grandmother. Estelle Eaton was an educator. She taught at two historically black colleges in North Carolina. For many years, she was the oldest resident in North Carolina, living to an age of 109. She was an avid traveler and incredibly independent. Her advice to me, my brothers and cousins, don't be like a crab in the barrel. When crabs are in a barrel, they all struggle to get out. They might crawl over each other as they compete to get free of the barrel. Once out of the barrel, they crawl away. As you achieve your goals, remember you never do it alone. Don't be like the crabs in a barrel and crawl away. Go back and help one other person achieve their goals. Let me say that again. Go back and help one other person achieve their goals. Thank you again for this incredible honor. And um, it's, a, a, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, that was really inspiring. I just found Estelle's message both powerful and moving. Uh, and I hope you did too. She's really such a remarkable person and has so much wisdom to share. So I'd like to once again, thank you Estelle for all you've done for vulnerable children and families and for your valuable service to the Beck Institute. It's been just a privilege to know you and a pleasure to honor you. Okay, now we'll begin our important panel discussion on youth mental health. 
You know, even before COVID-19, the data showed that mental health challenges among youth were so common and most frankly went untreated. So now that we're over two years into the pandemic, you know, the effects of isolation and remote schooling and unpredictable routines and anxiety about the virus, not to mention social media have combined with a shortage in care to create really a crisis situation. The pandemic has also exacerbated existing disparities with children from lower resourced areas being so less likely to receive the treatment that they need. And so whether you're a health or a mental health professional or a teacher or a parent or a concerned citizen, I think we all have a responsibility to the children in our communities to understand their problems and really try to identify solutions. And we're hoping that the following discussion will do just that. I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Friedberg, an expert in CBT with youth and a former Beck Institute scholar and currently a member of our Beck Institute faculty. And he's the one who's going to lead this discussion. Dr. Friedberg is currently a full professor at Palo Alto University, where he serves as director of the Center for the Study of Anxious Youth. He's authored or co-authored 11 books, including the Handbook of CBT for Pediatric Medical Conditions and Cognitive Behavior Therapy with Youth, Tradition and Innovation. I'm now going to turn the discussion over to Dr. Friedberg with my thanks to you and our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Beck, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whatever time zone you're tuning into. As uh, Lisa and Dr. Beck mentioned, we are privileged to be talking to perhaps over a thousand attendees from over 109 countries. So thanks for tuning in to this very exciting panel. As Dr. Beck mentioned, my name is Bob Friedberg and I am your host for this exciting panel on youth mental health. And again, it is my, prof pr my professional privilege and very personal pleasure to be sitting alongside three leading and quite indeed legendary be child behavioral health professionals. Dr. Mar Doctors Mary Freistad, Bruce Charpita, and Jess Shatkin. Their bios and professional achievements are voluminous. So voluminous that in this short panel, I don't even have time to read them out loud. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to direct you all to the, uh, to the websites that uh, on the on the on the summit, which give you the text of their amazing achievements, hundreds of publications, millions and millions of dollars in grant research, and uh, leaders in providing the cutting edge clinical care of youth. Um, now, nonetheless, I am going to take a, a a bit of a, a of an indulgence here and show you how much I value their wisdom because their their books are uh, stocked on my bookshelf. There's Mary's, there's Jess's, go out and get these, run, don't walk, run and go get these um, great clinical and uh, academic texts. Now onto the business and fun at hand. In a minute or so, I'm going to ask them to briefly introduce themselves and respond to two kind of personal questions um, that will hopefully give context to you all who may not be familiar with them about their individual stories that give, uh, again, a, that surround their development as leaders in the field. And those two questions, which I will repeat for each of them, is how and when did you become interested in working with kids and what do you love most about it? 
Once we finish with the introductions, we'll have four major questions to ponder in our time together. Each panelist will discuss a separate question and hopefully the other panelists will weigh in on their perspectives on the, uh, uh, our colleagues' comments. As the moderator, I will keep uh, my comments to a minimum and work to just facilitate the discussion. So let's begin. Mary, you're gonna lead us off with, um, just tell us a brief description of, uh, about yourself and in particular, tell us um, how did you become interested in working with kids and what do you love most? Thank you so much, Dr. Friedberg and Dr. Beck for this invitation to present today. I am a clinical child and adolescent psychologist. I am an emerita professor of psychiatry and behavioral health, psychology and nutrition from The Ohio State University. And now I have the best job in the world. I am director of academic affairs and research development at Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is the Department of Pediatrics and Pediatric Specialty Branch of the Ohio State University College of Medicine. So how did I get interested in working with kids? I took a psychology class in high school taught by the worst teacher possible, uh, one of the coaches from my high school who had no interest actually in teaching or the subject matter, but I found the book utterly fascinating. And I said, this is what I want to study. And so as I went off to college, my first very significant clinical experience was taking a semester out of school and living in and working at what was essentially a residential treatment center for adolescents. Uh, this was in Southern Minnesota where kids from the Chicago area predominantly were sent. And so I quickly learned that adolescence was really late in the game to help kids who had been damaged from a much earlier point in time and not to work with families was really missing the boat. So I decided I wanted to work with young kids and to uh, really incorporate family work in everything that I did. And I would say to answer the second question, which is kind of what do I love most about this work? I think it's a combination of head and heart. Uh, you have to be smart and insightful, I think, uh, to do therapy with kids, uh, but you've got to do it from the heart. And this is an amazing profession where we get to combine head and heart. And with that, I will stop and turn this over to the next speaker. Thanks, Mary. Uh, now next up is on our roll call is our psychiatrist, Dr. Jess Shatkin. Jess, come on and tell us a little bit about yourself and then again, how you got interested in working with kids and what do you love most? Sure, thanks for the questions. Thanks for the invitation, Bob, uh, Judy and uh, Mary and Bruce. It's a real honor to be on a panel with you together and welcome to everybody. Uh, so I am the vice chair for education in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU Medical Center, <clears throat> and uh, it's, I've been here 17 years. I, I'm going to compete with Mary. I think I got the best job in the world. So I love working with kids and families. I love working with young adults, and I have the honor of managing all of our training programs in psychiatry and psychology, the medical student activities, and a very large college program at NYU, as well as seeing patients and working with families and having a role in the administration of our department. Uh, really just a pleasure and a privilege every day to come to work and to do what I do. I am the youngest of five children, so probably enough is said as to why I went into this field. I observed a lot growing up. I saw how my siblings uh, functioned and how they misfunctioned at times and myself as well. In my seventh grade year, I worked with a group of kids with intellectual disability disorder one hour a day as a sort of a teaching assistant. And that was a phenomenal opportunity. And from there, I started volunteering in camps. I became a camp counselor for five years. And I just loved everything about working with kids and families and felt like it was intuitive and natural for me. Not that I always got it right, but that it just came to me honestly. And I, my father had been a pediatrician 
And later in his life, he trained in psychiatry and then child psychiatry. So even as I came of age around the dinner table, these were the conversations that we, we had about why people do what they do. What are people thinking? Why would they engage in this behavior? What must they be feeling in this family, in this environment? So always very exciting to me. And as far as uh, what I love most about it, I guess I really have always enjoyed working with kids from around the time they hit puberty until they sort of launch comfortably into adulthood. So roughly age 10 to about age 30 has always interested me. And I think because so much changes during that time, the brain changes, our behavior changes, we go from a very different person at eight to, uh, to that person at 30. And it's an enormous uh, reconstitution and, and personal evolution. And I remember my own so clearly and how many struggles there were with my peers and the difficulties that everybody had. So I come to it from a bit of family, a bit of history, and a lot of just passion and interest. I think I'm next, Bob. So I'm gonna just unmute and get going. The process of elimination, I assume that I'm next. So. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, Bruce Jorpita, I'm a professor of psychology at UCLA and a father of two great kids. Um, and I could tell you all about my uh, various professional experiences, but I think the experiences I should tell you about are the ones that led me to working with children. And that goes back to when I was 16, working in the Philadelphia suburbs in the fast food industry. And uh, one summer, I quit my job. Uh, I was working at a friendlies, uh, not far from the Beck Institute, and uh, ended up getting a job at a summer camp, sort of like Jess was describing, and um, just found it to be the best summer I had ever had. Uh, just in incredible, the, 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 the fun, the complexity of working with kids and uh, but the, the, the energy. And so, yeah, what do I like about it? What do I like about working with kids? Um, there's the, the lack of cynicism. I love elementary school, so I'll compliment what Jess said. The elementary school age kids, like the, this idea that so many doors are still open and there's still so much possibility and hope and this fresh, naive, uncynical perspective that you're surrounded by is 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 really uplifting and refreshing and uh and children are so important because they'll be the ones who run the world soon right so i guess for selfish reasons investing in in children is going to help us all uh, as we all get older and uh, i don't plan to be in charge of anything for much longer anyway that's my story um i'll turn it back over to bob Thanks, Bruce. And again, um, what a wonderful panel. Want to again thank them all for for being here. They're all volunteering to do this. So I am going to start the more formal part of this with a question that Dr. Shatkin will take the lead on, which is. The rates of mental health disorders, suicide, depression, anxiety, um, you name it, are surging in young people. That's, it's especially alarming in traditionally marginalized populations. So Dr. Shatkin, what's your take on why, what is happening and why? Sure, thanks for the question. So it's a really, uh, key question for all of us, because if we know why we're seeing higher rates, then maybe we can do something about it. So the first thing to keep in mind is that rates of mental illness among adults, at least, and secondarily children, have been rising with every generation since we've been monitoring this. Since World War II, at least, every time we look, every 10, 20 years that we do a nice, good study, we see higher rates. The second thing I wanna say is that higher rates are not epidemic. We hear about rates being epidemic all the time, but coming out of a career in public health before I went into medicine, 
An epidemic is something you don't expect. COVID's an epidemic because it comes out of the blue. We didn't have it, or if we had it, we didn't know it. And all of a sudden the rates rise. But we've been monitoring child mental health pretty closely for 25 years and bits and pieces before that. And we know that this didn't come out of the blue. This didn't just show up. This has been building for a long time and we've been seeing elevated rates for quite some time. The third thing I wanna say is that COVID has a role and we'll talk about COVID in a moment, but the increases as Judy Beck said at the beginning were happening before COVID. Uh, a little data for you, in the 10 years before COVID from 2009 until 19, there was a 40% increase in the number of high school students who reported pervasive feelings of sadness or hopelessness, which now affects one in three students at some point. And during the same decade prior to COVID, 2009 to 19, there was a 36% increase in the number of high school students who said they seriously were considering a suicide attempt. That total number is now almost 20%. And 44% increase in the number who made a suicide plan, which is now 16%. So this has been going on for a while. It's not epidemic. COVID has something to do with it. I'll talk about that in a moment. But it's not the only factor. Now to the heart of your question. You know, what are the likely contributors to the increased rates of mental illness in youth? It's not one thing, and there's no absolute answer to this, but I'll tell you what I think. I think there's a general increase in stress and recognition of stress. I think that, you know, stress is a term that didn't even enter our population until the 1920s. And once we started, started to apply stress to people, we started to appreciate its effect, ultimately its neurobiological effects, effects on our body and our mind. And the academic stress that kids feel, driven by parents, driven by themselves, driven by society, the interpersonal stress that kids feel in their relationships with others, which has always been there, but is going up for some reasons I'll talk about. The economic stress, the idea of will I get a job? Will I be able to perform? We are getting more and more people in this world, as you know, over 7 billion. And the recognition of that and that jobs are in some cases fewer or the kind of jobs people want may be fewer or the competition they perceive for those jobs may be greater. So there's a lot of worry there. And because people are talking about stress, we hear about it more. Another thing that is correlated undoubtedly, and we're getting a better sense of this now, but it's clearly something, it's, it's maybe not a straight line correlation, but it's, it's a direct correlation in, in, in parts. And that is social media and screen time. We see a lot more social isolation we see online bullying. We see kids having their whole life online. I'll give you some numbers. On average, we think that tweens, so those people just before teenage years, but after the elementary years, middle school kids, are spending about five and a half hours daily on screens for entertainment purposes. And that's two hours higher, actually, amongst minority youth. So you asked about minority youth, and I'll talk about BIPOC and, and LGBT kids in a moment. But amongst minority youth, we see higher numbers than, than amongst uh, majority population youth. Teens are spending about eight and a half hours a day on screens. So these are enormous amounts of time when they're isolated and they are on their own. And what ties into this is being alone, which we know happens in general. We know one of the greatest stressors even before screens that adolescents face is more alone time. They spend under 10% of their time alone before puberty, and they spend about a third of their time alone afterwards. So all these emotions are happening, all these hormones are kicking in, all these peer and social pressures are going on, and they're left with less support than they had before because they're around fewer people. Now, we are drawn to be alone sometimes during those years, but we're often also struggling when we're alone. The other issues that this ties into is the reduction then in physical activity. And we know that exercise is as good a treatment as psychotherapy, for mild and moderate levels of anxiety and depression. And so we're really getting a sense that people need to be exercising and benefit from that. Only about 20% of American kids get what the Centers for Disease Control considers to be an adequate amount of physical activity, which is about an hour a day. And we know that kids today run a mile about 90 seconds slower than kids did about 50 years ago. So there's a real change in our physical fitness and the social media and the screen life has only enhanced the, that. And it, dovetails into sleep. We're getting less sleep, adults as well as kids. And we've been watching this now for about 120 years. The, the amount of sleep that kids get has come down every time it's been studied in the last 120 years. So our kids are way underslept. And this ties into school start times and the kind of pressures they feel to do after school activities and to get into college and all that kind of stuff. 
add into that poor nutrition. And we have 42% of American adults who meet criteria for obesity based on 1990 standards. So we're getting heavier, we're getting less active, we're getting more isolated. And I think all of this contributes from the many factors that push on that. Now, COVID only made that worse. COVID increased our social isolation. COVID increased our fear and anxiety levels for all the reasons that it did. Uh, COVID increased um, uh, change in routines so that our usual routines weren't, weren't maintained. The thing I kept saying to all my patients and students during COVID was keep your routine get up at the same time, exercise the same way, take the walks. Yeah, wear a mask or don't be around as many people, but actually keep your day uh, organized. Don't just sit and watch Netflix. That's poison to your head. Now on the positive side as to why we're seeing more mental illness, we have improved assessment. We have better tools. We have more trained people, although we have a greater population. We don't have enough trained people, but we're training primary care doctors and nurses and social workers and all sorts of other people who school teachers and special ed teachers and parents even are getting educated. So as we learn more about what these things are, more people will be able to be diagnosed or, or at least directed to treatment. And that's part of the, the effect. And another positive here is we're seeing a reduction in stigma. There's plenty of stigma still, and we see that in the media all the time. Uh, shockingly so, even in this election in Pennsylvania, where we have a, uh, a, a Senate candidate who had a stroke and he's being teased about it. It's remarkable how insensitive we are to mental health and mental illness. At the same time, the general reduction in stigma, where people are more brave and coming forward and talking about their difficulties, results in more people getting help. Now, let me say a word about marginalized populations. It's not surprising that we see and have seen higher rates of substance use and suicide for decades among LGBTQ positive youth and minority youth. And all, thankfully, these, these rates sometimes normalize or come down to the general population rate as people head into adulthood. But mental illness amongst many BIPOC populations have traditionally been lower than white populations. Some of this probably has to do with access to care, which is typically not as good for minority populations. But we've seen a shift in recent years. Uh, suicide, which is the second or third, depending on which year you assess it, greatest cause of death among adolescents and young adults, has risen faster among Black and white youth for a few decades now. And early adolescent Black youth are now twice as likely to die by suicide than their white counterparts. So what accounts for that? We have these things called ACEs, adverse uh, childhood experiences like divorce and abuse and having a family member who's hooked, uh, addicted to drugs or having a family member who's incarcerated. We have community violence, which is greater in minoritized and poor neighborhoods. We have the socioeconomic stress. We have the lights and the noise in these neighborhoods that cause people to get less sleep, the discrimination people perceive, the stigma they perceive and the family conflict that results. And all of this uh, is ultimately a predictor for suicide amongst minoritized populations that is higher in again, poor and minority populations. And if you're a member of more than one minority population, so you're black and you're LGBTQ, then the risks are higher still for all of these same reasons. We also haven't been that good at recognizing and acknowledging health and substance use problems in black youth uh, in particular. And these problems are often undertreated or misdiagnosed and partly probably due to bias and racism. By the time black kids, uh, minority kids in general, but black kids have been studied here, I think a little better. By the time these kids do get clinical attention, they're often diagnosed with behavioral problems, which is an outcome, but not the root of the issue. The root of the issue is mental illness, but it wasn't seen, it wasn't brought to care, it wasn't addressed in treatment. And so these kids struggle and struggle and they become more behaviorally disruptive or, or act out. And then they end up in the juvenile detention system or they end up being problem kids, but in fact, they're struggling with depression or even ADHD and anxiety. So these kids are also more likely to receive poor quality of care and less likely to get uh, follow-up services after they go into the ER or they go into their pediatrician's office. And some of that has to do with insurance and access, and some of that has to do with real inequities, uh, distrust of the healthcare system, uh, which is for all the reasons I've been describing. And um, so this limits our opportunities for prevention. So all of these factors, I think, contribute to the problems that we see or, and why we're seeing more mental illness and, and why we see particularly high rates around minoritized populations. Thank you, Jess, for such a comprehensive and broad conceptualization, you know, and in integrating all these, the different factors and variables that could be determinative in, in what we're seeing. All right, now let's move to our second question. Um, which is uh, directed to uh, uh, Dr. Tarpita. What can be done 
Dr. Trapita, to stem the tide of these rising rates of, uh, in particular, depression, anxiety, trauma, and uh, behavior or conduct problems? Um, that's a great question. It's a, a big burden to <laughs> feel like I have to answer that question in seven minutes, but, um, but I'll start with some good news. Um, we know what works for anxiety, depression, trauma, and behavior problems. So the, 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 if, if there are folks who are wondering, well, we just need to more research because we don't know what to do about these things. Uh, the good news is we, we for, the, for the most part we do, uh, there are 1,450 randomized clinical trials for children's mental health that I'm aware of uh, as of this month and the more come out every month um, and the procedures that work and that are effective, yeah, they change a little, but for the last 25 years, they've pretty much been the same thing, slight variations and so forth. So for a long time, we've known things that are quite effective and helpful. We, meaning that knowledge is out there somewhere. Who is the we and who knows? That's more complicated, but it is known how to deal with these things. Practicing what you're afraid of helps your fear go away. Doing activities helps depression. Um, writing about and talking about traumatic experiences can be helpful. And plenty of things help behavior problems like reward programs and praise and things like that. So there are answers. Uh, those answers are well documented in thousands of studies and trials. Um, so the question then is why are we not already living in a mentally healthier society? Uh, and I'm going to say there are really two challenges that are behind that. One of them is the insufficient size of the workforce. So just adolescents alone, there's 1.2 billion adolescents in the world. About 10% of them have mental health challenges at some point, conservatively. And um, our workforce in high-income countries is about 70 mental health professionals per 100,000. But in 90% of the world, the numbers are more like two mental health professionals per 100,000. Um, even here in the US, you know, that's just the, is there someone to talk to? But there's a quality gap of what people know, which I'll get to in a minute. And even here in the US, where we're a wealthy society with most of that research was done here, um, we enjoy huge advantages compared with the rest of the world. Um, Many of us struggle to find good referrals, even for our own family and friends, uh, those of us who work in the mental health industry. So it's to find high quality care is still challenging, even in the best places in the world. Uh, that's unacceptable. And things are happening. I'll get to solutions in a moment, but we don't have the workforce size we need. One little corollary I'll say is it's not as simple as it being a money problem. Um, I can just say in the, I live in Los Angeles and our public school system was trying to hire 400 social workers last year because they had that many vacancies. So they had the funding, they didn't have the people to hire. And um, so there's something else going on here in our ability to create a prepared workforce. Um, so the second part of that is the ability for the workforce we do have as limited as it is, to make use of those 1,450 randomized trials worth of research findings. The research, as we've designed it, is not actionable in a way that achieves the public benefit we all want it to have. Um, for various reasons, for good, good intentions, um, everyone has researchers who develop these things, like myself, get so concerned about the quality of how things are delivered, uh, that sometimes we let perfect be the enemy of the good and we don't let the programs go out and be used by a wide variety of people in more flexible ways and formats and so forth. So there's this sort of keeping our arms around that research so tightly has made it very hard um, uh, for people who want to help to use that, to use those programs. So just to make it concrete, there are over 900 evidence-based treatment programs for youth as of today. There's 932 today. 
Um, the best trained people I know in mental health care and youth mental health care typically know about three or four of those because it takes a long time to get trained and credentialed in any one of them and so forth. So that system, something needs to change about that. Uh, so I've taken us into this bad news. I'm supposed to be answering what stems the tide, but what's the, what's the good news or how are we going to move forward? And I would say one thing to walk away with on this Saturday is this idea of uh, if we were to say, how do we build a high functioning, mentally healthy society? We need three things, three things, count them out. The first one is detection and screening. And you heard from Jess, we're doing pretty well at that. We're identifying more and more uh, mental health challenges among people. And um, uh, that's so that's the first leg of the stool. This is like legs of the stool. So if we have a one legged stool, we all know what happens. It tips over. So we, we need to do more than identify what's out there. So the second is intervention. Second leg of the stool, we need high quality and widely available mental health intervention. That is the, the challenge, as I said, the, the workforce challenge and preparing that workforce um, is one of the greatest challenges that lies before us in our generation here. Um, the third leg of the stool is attitudes and engagement in mental health. So even if we identify all the challenges in a timely way, we have high quality, widely available interventions. We also know from studies that about half of families drop out of high quality treatment uh, and fail to achieve uh, the full benefit of that treatment. So we need to also figure out ways to meaningfully engage families and make it easy for families to participate and benefit from these, these interventions. So how do we get there? on those three legs. Uh, the good things that are happening, um, lots of good stuff is happening with screening. Um, people following it may know that US Preventive Services Task Force just made recommendations about anxiety screening this year, uh, mental health screenings in schools and primary care is going on. More of that is good. People who are concerned, is it risky to screen? It is not a bad idea to screen. It's good to screen. It doesn't create problems. It just helps us see them. Every house has a smoke detector. Every school should have screening, right? If, if the consequences of not detecting something are bad, we should be screening. Uh, that's going pretty well, could be even better. Um, the second leg of the stool intervention, I would say a significant reboot in how we make use of our research findings is, is needed. How do we democratize all that research that the public invested in and make sure people know? You know, I started by saying we know what works, we, but most families I talk to don't know. And that's, that's unacceptable. At this point, it should be social fact, it should be common knowledge. How do we do that? Um, so that really requires a complete rethinking of our paradigms and the way we do things. I appreciate Bob plugging my book. Uh, but I'm not a huge fan of books as the best way to do that. Uh, most people, they take too long to read and most people need an answer right now. My child can't go to sleep. What do I do right now? I need my wristwatch to tell me how do I help my child fall asleep? You know, that's the world we need to design and it's possible and people are working on it, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, one other example I'll give in terms of um, this intervention workforce piece. Um, Department of Labor in the U.S. Uh, shows that 93% of psychology undergraduates do not go on to a career in mental health. These are, I teach undergraduates in psychology, they're some of the most excited, uh, kind, generous, uh, bright individuals who want to be part of the solution, and 93% of them go into careers other than mental health because it's extremely challenging to become a mental health provider without going to graduate school and doing lots of different things uh, that take years and take privilege and so forth. So I, I do wanna give a shout out to what I think is an interesting social experiment uh, uh, that's happening in Oregon. The Balmer Institute is um, a new campus in Portland trying to 
uh, create a new discipline of bachelor's level mental health providers uh, that will provide care in the state and hopefully be a model for the U.S. and other other places. Uh, other countries know they have to do this. In the U.S., we um, we we don't do as well with paraprofessionals as they do in other countries. Um, so we need to be able to have less credentialed providers act on what we know from all this great research on interventions. Um, and then finally, elevating engagement science. You know, just knowing that 50% of families can't meaningfully engage in treatment means we have to make more of our training curricula and more of our science about what is it that prevents families, what are the barriers that prevent families, whether it's attitudes, structural barriers, whatever it is, prevents them from engaging and participating in therapy in a way that, that is meaningful and allows them to benefit. Uh, so I will stop there. I know I, I said a lot, I wanna leave time for the other speakers. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce, for that, um, again, really thought-provoking, really raising a lot of important points about detection and screening, the importance of intervention, increasing attitudes and engagement in mental health. Love the notion of every house has a smoke detector. Why not a, a, a way to identify problems, increasing public awareness of, of uh, evidence-based practices, task shifting the workforce, and making changes to the curriculum. Lots to think about. All right, now we move to question three from Dr. Freistad. What, how do we ensure equitable access to the services that Dr. Trapita and Dr. Shatkin mentioned, particularly for marginalized populations? Okay, I'll see if I can answer that question completely in seven minutes. Probably not. First, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, there we go. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people whose slides I have borrowed for this presentation, uh, Drs. Bodapati, Ackerman, and Hostetler from Nationwide Children's Hospital. And I just want to reference back to comments that both Dr. Shatkin and Chorpita made. Uh, I, I totally resonate with the importance of what I use the acronym SEAM, sleep, eating, exercise, mindfulness, or meditation or prayer, all as critical elements of mental health. And I think we just need to build that in uh, to every aspect of what we do. And uh, Dr. Shatkin made that point and Dr. Chorpita really made the point that we need novel implementation strategies. And if you look at the statistics, you'll see why that's so important. 11% of kids have or had ha have had a mental illness with severe impairment at some point in their life, 22% uh, of teens. And we know that only 50% of youth with mental health disorders receive any behavioral health treatment. And Dr. Chirpita was really referencing that. The need is too great to be solved one office visit at a time. I think we need to go where the kids already are. We need to go to schools. We need to go to primary care. We need to go to recreation kind of centers and we need to be open. COVID gave us the amazing experiment of forcing us all into telehealth, whether we wanted to go there kicking or screaming or not. Uh, and I think we had more success in most cases than we anticipated we possibly could. So I just wanna talk a little bit about each of those. Uh, prevention should be uh, really upstream and integrated. We are not gonna be able to treat ourselves out of this public health crisis. We need trauma-informed, cost-effective, universal, scalable prevention solutions that address a range of, of barriers uh, that really address gaps in access and utilization. Again, my question is really, how do we provide equitable access? And we aren't gonna do that where private payers are you know, really the driving the system. It's just not going to happen. Uh, as Dr. Charpita said, we've got a shortage of providers and barriers to accessing evidence-based treatment. Uh, we need, uh, we have got capacity challenges. We need uh, training, supervision, consultation, and we've got a lot of limitations in providing evidence-based care. 
So when we think about an optimal system of care, we want to start at the bottom. We really need to put more money into prevention, more effort into prevention, and then consultation for provider support. And then from there on, move up that, that scale that you see, outpatient, intermediate, residential crisis, inpatient care. From a school-based behavioral health model, we can do a lot of really good prevention. Some of the work, and I'll just use some examples that we're using here at Nationwide Children's Hospital, uh, we have integrated into uh, a large chunk of the state of Ohio. Uh, roughly 20 counties now have PACS Good Behavior Game, uh, Triple P parenting programs. We've integrated signs of suicide into schools. And from a pre-K perspective in our early childhood mental health uh, program, classroom consultations to keep kids in preschool settings. It's very tragic when kids have, have, by the time they get to kindergarten, have been kicked out of multiple preschools, it does not set them off for a, a good beginning for mental health. We wanna think about summer programming. So that's the really preventive work that can be done in a school-based setting. From there, you can move up to group therapy or move up that pyramid to individual and family therapy, but we really wanna start with a large base of prevention programs. Uh, again, PAX Good Behavior Game is one example of that. And we know from long-term outcomes, and this is just an incredibly engaging social emotional learning curriculum that's implemented in elementary schools. And long-term outcomes include up to 50% reduction in suicidal ideation, 68% reduction in tobacco use, a little over a third reduction in alcohol dependence, 50% reduction in other substance use, a quarter reduction in violent and criminal behavior. So this is incredibly exciting work. And I think we just really need to move to a prevention model whenever possible. Uh, looking at the, the preschool, uh, uh, work that, that's been done uh, just within our own program. And these are easily replicated programs around the country. Uh, over 12,000 early childhood professionals have been trained. Uh, and there's a statewide expulsion prevention hotline. Uh, over 2,000 calls have reached over 40,000 children. So this is, again, from a prevention perspective, a relatively low cost, scalable model of care. So again, really emphasizing that prevention. Moving into where do youth spend times? Uh, there's a suicide prevention initiative launched by Dr. Ackerman, collaborating with our Center for Suicide Prevention and Research, Boys and Girls Clubs. And Boys and Girls Clubs are throughout the country. Uh, there are thousands of kids, tens of thousands of kids who participate in that. Uh, and they've developed a suicide prevention model where the staff at the Boys and Girls Club are really giving those messages and taking some of that, like what Dr. Torpedo was saying, taking bachelor's level uh, folks and giving them kind of the fundamentals of mental health basics uh, and implementing them in, in everyday settings where youth already exist. And you see from a pre-test, post-test perspective, uh, there's an increase in confidence and increase in feeling prepared to deal with kids who are at risk for suicide in those settings. So providing on the spot care. Moving over to primary care, uh, cross out the notion that physical health is separate from mental health. We know it's a transaction transactional process that's best supported by integrated approaches to care. Scratch out the idea that most kids are healthy and that only a subset struggle with mental disorders. You've seen the statistics, you've heard about them in this, in all three presentations. We're living through a longstanding and worsening mental health crisis and we need mental wellness at the population level. And it's a misnomer to think that most patients with behavioral health problems will see a behavioral health specialist. We're lucky if we get to 50%. We know that parents prefer to receive behavioral health advice within primary care and most mental health services are delivered and, and to have most mental health services delivered by places where their kids already are, primary care, schools, religious leaders. So while some youth and families need traditional services, having brief and or single session services at that primary care level can really increase families' access to evidence-based behavioral health care. And most kids are able to access some form of primary care 
through some sort of public funding, making it more equitable than specialized behavioral health care. Not perfect, but certainly better. So again, we want to think from that well population preventing disease before it happens, minimizing risk factors through patient education and preventive interventions. From there, we can go into early identification and intervention uh, and improving quality of life. So how do you do that? There's a variety of ways. One version, and I'm just gonna quickly throw these ideas out there. These can be easily disseminated across the country. These are models that we and other centers are using. Schedule video consultations for community providers. This provides support to primary care providers on medication management, diagnostic clarification, treatment planning. It improves quality of care, reduces the emergency department visits, and then supporting access, supporting links to community, uh, to community-based resources rather than coming into specialty care. An example of that is Project Echo, where you've got a specialist team who, on a regular basis, uh, have like over the lunch hour, have a lunch and learn sort of experience where local providers take turns sharing cases, and then they are able to provide better care to their own patient population. The specialist team never directly interacts with the patients. So it's a distribution and a magnification of expertise. And here you see an example within the state of Ohio, our total echo reach to date. And here we are in Franklin County where uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital is, and here's the reach that we've had throughout our state. Uh, that's improved knowledge and confidence of providers, self-reported practice change, and a reduction, interestingly, in polypharmacy as a result. So this goes out to primary care sites, uh, pediatricians and family practitioners. Again, how can you do uh, integrated primary care? You start at the bottom of that pyramid again, supporting to the primary care team without any direct patient contact. Those curbside consults, universal screening, trainings, workflow development, toolkits, bulletin boards. From there, you can move up to joint appointments, co-located visits, and then moving on if needed to traditional behavioral health. But each of these should reduce the number of patients who are needing that kind of care. And then what happened with the experiment of COVID? Zoom, we went from no telehealth within behavioral health to instantaneously reaching about a 99% penetrance of behavioral health within about a month's time. And that's been trickling down over time. But I would say my, in my own experience, I was not the least bit interested in doing telehealth. I loved seeing people in person, but I'm not the one who has to drive to the office. I'm not the one who leaves my work site, drives halfway across town to my kid's school, and then drives back to the therapist's office. It's incredibly convenient for families to use telehealth. I will say it's not great when you're trying to do psychotherapy with a young kid who's a little squirrely and off the screen. But other than that, it actually works remarkably well. My uh, colleagues who do parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT, have loved being able to do in-home coaching because they see the family in their actual setting, uh, something that none of us probably would have predicted would work so well before the gift that COVID gave us. And then I want to reflect just a little bit more broadly on what in the world is going on in society. We got a little bit of that commentary at the beginning, but you know, every year there's a happiness index that's calculated. And if you look at in 2021 and 2020, <clears throat> who scored at the top? Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland. What do they have in common? Uh, they have low crime rates. They're a beautiful natural environment. They have a strong sense of community and cooperation. They have universal health care. Afghanistan is the saddest country. We don't want to model them. Um, but the U.S. is not doing so hot. We're down at 19. So we pride ourselves on so many things, being the leader in so many ways, but we're not the leader in happiness. So I think we need to just step back a little bit and think, what about our country isn't really producing good mental health? Uh, and I would go back to some of the comments that Dr. Shatkin had made turn off your devices, get outside, get some vitamin D, get some exercise in fresh air, in nature, uh, take that nature walk. These are all things that are incredibly beneficial. Uh, our grandmothers would tell us, get enough sleep, 
get enough exercise, eat healthfully, uh, have some time to center yourself. And I would say also find a way to get out of your own head. So volunteering uh, becomes an incredibly important aspect. So in summary, I would say the need is great. Creativity is essential. We need to think carefully about what makes a healthy culture and what currently in our culture is not so healthy. I think paradigm shifts are in order and I would love to hear others' ideas in our last three minutes that we have together. Thank you. Mary, again, this panel just does not disappoint. Again, so much things to ponder, so many things to ponder. Again, important points of seeing kids where they're at, the importance of prevention and making that upstream, school-based, working in boys and girls clubs. And I particularly want to encourage you all to have paid attention to the really forward-thinking uh, initiatives that are going on at Nationwide. I am mindful of the time that we, again, we had a lot to say, and I mean, we probably could go on maybe even for an hour with these, another hour with these fabulous panelists, but I got a, uh, a, a note from our producers that uh, we should go to uh, the question and answer period. So I see it, just a couple and uh, the only ones I have are the ones on the chat. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or should I just take the ones I have here from the chat? If you want to pick one or two from the chat, that'd be perfect. Okay, let me ask, let me go with the uh, with one. And this is for anyone who wants to weigh in. Um, what are some relatively easy or achievable wins that the mental health community could enact to achieve accountability and access for youth care treatment? Who wants to weigh in on that one? Bruce, why don't you go ahead? Because I think about uh, this as a treatment delivery The strategy. hard part, the reason I'm stalling is because achievable, yes. Easy, I don't know. Um, so achievable, I'll say um, more things like what I mentioned earlier is happening at the Balmer Institute, um, experimenting with ways to create a prepared workforce that's non-traditional as by US standards and to manage and, and equip them to succeed. Um, and the other one, definitely not easy, but is achievable and is being worked on, is making uh, all this great stuff that we know about what makes people mentally healthy more accessible. Um, so a quick thing, if I ask my phone, where's the closest place to buy dog food, I can get an instant answer that's highly reliable. And that's because of a very complex way the internet is organized and that search works. Um, I can't get an answer like that about mental health intervention because machines don't read studies yet. But people are working on that and we should continue to invest in and push for a world where the, all of our research findings can be read, accumulated, organized by machines. Where do, we, where do we learn what to do? Most of us look on the internet for answers now or we ask our phone or our watch or whatever. That's the world we're going into. We need to have those answers to be able to come through those devices for us without programs or just um, and just to enable those devices to read research and give us reliable, scientifically informed answers. Uh, and it, it sounds like science fiction, but it's absolutely not. There are great teams of people working on that now. And we need to continue to invest in that or we'll never make use of all this great research we have. Thanks, Bruce. Jess, do you want to weigh in? Sorry, it took a second to turn on. Uh, I, I think I, I was going to uh, um, echo a lot of what Bruce said, which is why I thought it was best that he say it given his background. But I think there's a lot of things that we can do 
this was more of a treatment question, but in, and so if we're just focused on treatment, Mary's comment about school mental health clinics and about finding kids where they're at rec recreation centers. We know that when we give kids after school activities, for example, when we give them whether learning support, sports, music, whatever, they spend a lot less time getting into trouble. They smoke cigarettes at a much lower rate. They have less uh, you know, unprotected intercourse, all these kinds of things just from occupying their time in an effective and, and supportive way. We know that where we have school mental health clinics, kids who need care get care. Where we don't have them, when they get referred in the community, they most commonly don't get care. And where we have school mental health clinics, we have support for kids, not only who are getting care, but kids around them do better because there is a more contained environment about somewhere under 40% of our American public schools, 95,000 or so public schools have some mental health care, but it's so variable and it's so inconsistent. And schools are run not just by the federal government, which has some provisions and the state has some provisions and the communities have some provisions and it's all different. So I think we need some uniformity there as well in order to bring uh, our happiness index up as Mary was saying, and to provide care to kids who need it. I'm really interested in prevention personally. I think there's a lot we can do before we get to the point that we need to send kids to a clinic. And there's lots to talk about there, which we didn't have time for, but you know, parenting support, teaching parents about behavioral parenting, uh, more sports, more sleep, uh, better nutrition, delaying school start time for teens, making condoms available in school. There's a million things that actually promote mental and physical wellness for kids that we don't do very well or consistently. Thanks, Jess. And again, we are just about out of time, so I'm going to uh, wrap up. However, we will uh, get your questions uh, and try to answer them afterwards and, and send that out. So as, as a wrap up, again, I wanna thank Drs. Freistad, Shatkin, and Trapita for sharing their wisdom. I wish we had more time to both answer the questions and uh, hear more from more, hear more from them. Um, I also want to thank uh, all the staff at uh, the Beck Institute for their support and encouragement of this panel, uh, doctors doctors Beck and Miller for inviting us, uh, Lisa Pote for su supporting this. And I would be remiss if I didn't. This is something I always now am doing in any of these presentations, which is to to state my acknowledgement for the contribution that Dr. Beck, uh, Dr. Aaron Beck, the late Dr. Aaron Beck made to me personally in his wisdom, his guidance, his encouragement, particularly to find my own voice in cognitive therapy um, is still, still so inspiring. And without that, I don't think this panel would have occurred. So um, I want you all just to keep that in mind. With that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Judy Beck, and thank you all for attending. Well, I really want to thank everyone for attending this important event, and a special thanks to our panelists and to our wonderful moderator, Bob Friedberg. You know, the four of you have so much experience and expertise, and I just appreciate your taking the time to address our community. I hope everyone got some ideas about how to help the youth in your community, whether it's through prevention or treatment or getting the word out. Um, and you know what would be great? I hope that everyone will try to think of at least one small action that they can take to move the issue of youth mental health forward. And here's my suggestion. Think of one thing that you can do and then pull out your schedule and actually figure out when you're going to do it. And if you haven't already, I hope you'll visit our website to sign up for our newsletter. We're planning to send a link to this recording, uh, to the recording of this really important presentation over email soon. On behalf of our wonderful speakers and panelists and our excellent Beck Institute staff, I thank you again all for being with us. I thank our panelists and moderators for this very special event. And everyone, have a great weekend. Go Phillies. <laughs> <laughs>